we are now recording. You're all set. Excellent. Thank you, Lisa. Yep. Well, welcome, everybody. We'll get started only because it's a pretty uh, heavy agenda to cover. And so welcome. There are just a few of us. I was going to ask Dustin to introduce his cat. What's Who's your cat, <laughs> Dustin? She always shows up. Sorry, there's two of them. That one's Charlie. And yeah, they do like to show up in Zoom calls. <laughs> Charlie, OK. And Jody's joined us. So if you could just introduce yourselves, I will um, go through you know, just a quick presentation, and then we'll have some discussions. So Jody, do you want to introduce yourself? You're on mute. Oh gosh. Okay. Yes. Hi. It's Jody. Still technically challenged, and I'm part of this work group. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yes, uh, I guess that's all. All right. Okay. So Jody, Dustin, and I met as a subgroup. Um, John, do you want to int introduce yourself? So Jody and Dustin know you. Uh, sure. Yep. Um, I wasn't part of the group you just met, but I think I've met them on previous calls. My name is John Lemelin. I'm on the task force. I'm also on the, uh, I'm on a couple other working groups, including the public safety working group, and excited to be part of this group. Great. All right. So uh, Dana is going to join the call. She's was actually going to present today. Then she remembered she's on vacation and she wasn't quite sure how her internet would be. So she helped me prepare the presentation. And she will join the call when she's able. And uh, all right, so this is actually, I think in my, you know, I, I work with policy. This is going to be the most interesting meeting. So let me, oh, there's Dana. Dana, do introduce yourself. She's on mute. Dana, this Dana is a student who's helping us with the research. So Dana, just introduce yourself a bit. Tell, tell folks who you are and what you do. Are you on mute? Can you hear hi, me? Everyone. I'm hi, everyone. I'm Dana. Yeah. Uh, hi. I am a student at Mount Holyoke. Um, I'm majoring in sociology and minoring in statistics. Um, and I'll be helping out this work group for the summer. And I'm really excited to be working with everyone. Um, sorry, you guys are a little bit glitchy, but Hopefully, this should be OK. Where are you? You're moving quite a bit. Are you? Is your internet? Hello, can you hear me, Dana? Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, All right. Am I OK on your end? Yeah. I Sometimes can you're freezing up. Again. No, that's fine. You're freezing up, but that's OK. You did warn me that this may happen so that's okay so i okay, will cool. so i will go through review what dana and i worked on a bit dana helped with uh kind of the demographics developing some of the demographics charts and so let me share the presentation with you let's see let me see from beginning Sorry, I, I get mixed up. So let me let me do this. I know which sometimes uh, when I present, let's see if I do. Um, let me try one thing. Okay, so if I do now present now a window, and let's see which window am I presenting. Cancel entire screen. Let's do this. Share. You're seeing a blank screen, but when I present, it'll jump up there. So her beginning. OK, can you see the screen? Yes? Yep. OK, fantastic. OK, thanks. So uh, 
this is uh, what I call moonshots and earth shots. Today is July 20th, and I, the reason I was actually going to do this one in August, but then seeing this is 52 years since first man stepped on the moon, we push, I pushed the policy a little forward by a month because we are going to give our moonshots and earth shots related to racial equity and justice. So one of the processes we'll follow is this mission-oriented innovation policies, which I've been watching with a lot of interest. It's been done uh, internationally. And OK, so it's happy. So happy National Moon Day. Uh, and what John F. Kennedy, President John F. Kennedy said is, we chose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they are hard. And as you know, a couple of billionaires went to space and came back because, to be honest, that is somewhat even easier than addressing racial equity and justice. And so what we want to know is what is our moonshot? How are we going to address racial justice and equity in Niskayuna? So this is our task force charge, which I always bring forward. Um, and the highlighted ones are the ones that we've started. We've opened a lot of jars, never really closed it. And we'll start beginning to at least partially connect them in September. But today we'll begin is begin this uh, thinking about how do we have ongoing dialogue, what kind of programs or policies we're going to work on, and talk about what racial, ethnic, uh, socioeconomic data are available for Niskayuna. So as usual, our uh, workshop, our work group values and ground rules are, you know, we have to trust each other and believe that whatever we are doing is really has a good intent and ask if we are not sure. Uh, we connect with each other, uh, respect, we are intentionally inclusive, so we see who's not, not part of the group. And right now we know quite a few folks are not part of the group that we are working together. Everything that we do, we usually do at a meeting and build up at the next meeting. And you'll see that happening. And what we're looking at is how the different parts of racial equity and justice connect with each other. What are the relationships? And then we'll start working within each of them. So initially, I'll give you a, a bit of a review and then discuss the demographic talk a little bit about the process. And most of the time, we'll spend talking and brainstorming policies. So that's why I sent you that handout. But if you had kind of had a chance to glance through it, I think you'll still be able to kind of participate. Copy of the presentation and handouts are in the shared drive. So to review, why does Niskayuna value racial equity and justice? This is a photograph um, at uh, the Platnik Park. That's my son, actually. Three years ago, we have been trying to establish monarch habitats at Blatnik Park. And actually, they are like amazing. They love, the milkweeds love the lake, the pond. But we value it because it increases life expectancy, well-being, and resiliency. It'll regenerate vibrancy of the town, society, and planet. And uh, let me take this out. And optimizes a nurturing environment, add, adding value to a dynamic town. So for the first two meetings, we really did not discuss data. And I was talking about um, systems and complexity. That was basically kind of adding, kind of building our superpowers. So now we have some superpowers one is a lens we see hidden structures and interdependencies we are adaptive and we work with emerging opportunities and challenges and we sense we kind of build on community send uh, community strengths we have empathy we appreciate gifts each of us brings shares and receives gifts and we have reach that we engage, bring in different groups situated within structures, cultures, and across geographies, including everyone and leaving no one behind. These are actually the three frameworks we kind of talked about is uh, the systems, the well being, and we call the targeted universalism. But to use these super superpowers, you need to practice, like any dragon needs to practice, right, to be a good dragon. So we need to practice, and uh, that's what we'll, we'll work on as we move forward. 
So to talk a little bit about demographics, and this is where I want to thank Dana for jumping right in and kind of helping with some of the charts. As we look, as we share the charts, we'll, uh, I want you to think which data stood out to you the most and why? What conclusions about Niskayuna can you draw from the data? Do these challenging existing assumptions you had about Niskayuna, if so, why or why not? What hidden structures do you see? Who are marginalized in our community? And are, are there other demographic data we should review? Now, we'll spend more time talking about data in August, but if you think especially there's something more, just put it in the chat so, I don't, so we don't miss it. So this is uh, the percentage, the age distribution in, in our town, a population uh, from the American Community Survey, uh, which is a five-year kind of, you know, they do it every year. And um, they, we get this from the five-year estimate is 22,267. So you see, we have a lot of folks 35 to 44, 45 to 54. That's why the median age in Iskayuna is 44 years. Males to females, more or less the same. And you also see actually there's quite a few in the 65 to 74 year, 74 range. Uh, I know several, at least um, some of us were interested in disability, so I put it there. 6.6% live with a disability under 65 years of age. And about 2.5% are persons without health insurance under 65 years. Our racial ethnic population has sta been stable over the past 10 years. So you can see uh, white, we are predominantly uh, white. And you have Asian as the next highest one, and then a Black or African American and Hispanic or Latino. Now, I've discovered this site, uh, the Capital Region Indicators, uh, which is great because they have trend data, and that saves us a lot of time. Uh, so then in terms of educational attainment, you see quite a few with master's, bachelor's, um, and a very small group that doesn't have 12th grade or no diploma. So you see that 84.3% are in uh, three to uh, three, three to four year olds are enrolled in, in some school. Uh, only 1.2% have no high school diploma equivalent and 43.4% are with bachelor's degree or higher. You see labor force participation over here, only 3.2% uh, unemployed. Uh, though it has been growing, they said 22.32%. And again, you see kind of male, female, kind of equivalent number of folks working in, in the different uh, groups. This one was interesting. This is median household income by race ethnicity. And you see the white is red. It's kind of slowly increasing. And uh, the black is like up and down, it goes up. And actually last time it, it kind of exceeded the white. Part of it may be the small number of black or African-American. And this is a survey. And then you see uh, the Hispanic is actually going in the wrong direction. And the Asian, which is orange, is, in, is among the highest and has been increasing, increasing quite a bit. This is poverty, high, poverty is higher among females. You see on the left-hand side, the beige bars are poverty and the below poverty and the other, other ones, the gray ones above. You see more females, some in the males, 35 to 44, 55 to 64, 75 and over, and some children. These children are probably affiliated with the adults there. So when you're trying to identify who's uh, marginalized, we're definitely looking at this group too. Then this was an interactive that uh, the New York Times had a few years ago uh, based on Raj Chetty's and his group's team research in Harvard. You could put in the name of your county and uh, 
they would tell you which is the best and worst place to grow up, especially if you're poor. And when we put in Schenectady County, basically it said Schenectady County is pretty bad for income mobility for children and poor families. It is only better than about 26% of the counties. Um, and this was noteworthy because then since then they've got money to do this opportunityinsights.org site and they just uh, this week, uh, was it last week, they started a course on how, they had a course in spring and they made it online on how to explore uh, these maps and they have it at the county level. But the reason I put this is because it's imp when we are trying to look at a small population of marginalized communities, it's helpful to see beyond just Niskayuna because it gives you some picture of what may be difficult or what are the barriers. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. These are the questions I asked, and I'll see if you had any thoughts about what stood out for you, if it challenged any assumptions. What thoughts did you have about the data presented so far? I think it's really interesting. I haven't seen this type of data. Um, some of the things that stood out to me was the the stat about the bachelor's degrees and what was it like about 40% had bachelor's or higher. And in my mind, I, I thought that, that would be a bit higher for NISTI UNA. Mm -hmm. um, so interesting there. Um, and I liked seeing that the black or the African American, that their median household income has been going up. Um, well, it sounds like it's been going up and down, but um, that was a that was an interesting one to see kind of the spike from 2018 to 2019. Right. Um, yep, yeah, that's what stood out. I think this graph kind of highlights for me the difficulty in in studying a group that's that's quite small. I mean, if you slice down by race, race ethnicity in a small town, you're going to get you know, the, the error bars on this are probably very large. There are no error bars on this graph, but I'm sure they encompass most of that blue line. Um, and I think that highlights the difficulty of measuring in a group that small of measuring results because um, you get lots of statistical insignificance. And also you start to see the effects of individuals or, or, or small groups of people really have a strong influence on your on your outcomes. Mm -hmm. So that, that could make things difficult. The the one thing I wondered when I looked at this one, that too caught me by surprise. If you look at per capita income, it's just what you expect. But they say median income is better indicator than per capita income. And so then I wondered was when I looked at this and I wonder, do we make it really hard? So only Blacks who have a certain level can enter Niskayuna. I just wondered whether this was related because Schenectady County statistics are very dominated by the city, you know? And so I just wondered, is it that only, but that's that's true of Niskayuna. It's getting more and more not affordable, right? To move into Niskayuna. Are, pretty, are all of these numbers Schenectady County or? No, this one is this. This is Niskayuna. But the rest are they mixed together? I, thank you for of course saying that. I didn't put that. This is this is Niskayuna. This is Niskayuna. This is Niskayuna. I should say town of Niskayuna. This is Nis. Most of it is Niskayuna. And I'll put that in. All of this is Niskayuna. The only disconnected county is this one. Is this one? Thank you for catching that. And I keep looking at the graphs and didn't look at the titles too much. But they're all Niskayuna. All right, so we'll move on because think about it. Uh, what I was trying to look at is when I said, what hidden structures do you see? So I'm wondering, are we making it really difficult for some people to get into Niskayuna? Who are marginalized in, their communi in our community? You know, I'll definitely look at poverty. I look at the children and adults. I look at the older, it seems like quite a few of our older 
females especially that's the top one the middle one is uh maybe poor and that gives you kind of limited opportunities so so that's what i was looking at who are marginalized you know and uh are there other demographic data we should review put that in the chat because what i want you to think about is if if i had to ask you if you had to describe niska you know a place in two or three words what would you say what would you like it like to say rather For me, it was Niski in a place I call home, I belong to. Think about it. You don't have to give the answer. You can put it in the chat, right? I'm going to call welcoming. Judy wrote welcoming. Thank you. All right. What I want most of our discussion really is to uh, focus on what it is we'd like to see in this Kayuna. So I'm going to go through what we discussed last time. Three themes, well-being, resilience across the lifespan, opportunity to thrive and justice for all. I got these ideas from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, though I didn't interpret it the same way. They focused on youth, and I think we need to focus across the lifespan, just different interpretation. The difference between these three are the well-being, res resilience across the lifespan, emphasis is on inclusion and social cohesion. Uh, opportunity to thrive is emphasis on community wealth building, which is more than income. It's housing, supports. And justice for all is emphasis on access to opportunities. So then, this is this is where we come to our moonshots and earth shots, right? We have we know of mission mission statements and vision statements. We take a whole day to do it, and we put it on a shelf. But this is like really like mission, like you know, a movie kind of mission where you have something to to resolve. So this is what I've seen happening, and I think it's an exciting way to work. So this is like, I was reading a paper trying to see well, how they define it. So ba they basically defined it as policies where you actually use like frontier knowledge, knowledge that's emerging to attain specific goals. They call it big science deployed to meet big problems because these big problems are social as much as technological, right? And very often they're not very clearly defined and must be co-defined by many. So having said that, these are some of the countries working on missions. And if you if you go closely, you'll see what the missions are, but I don't expect you to. But it basically, when we do something, a mission, it presents a challenge for us to address collectively. It offers a dedicated and tailor-made space for collective action adapted to our context. And we can, this approach can be developed gradually by trying out policies and programs and learning from our experiences. And there are many initiatives to learn from. So there are many people doing it around the world. So this is example of a mission-oriented innovation policy. So clean oceans, you have the grand challenge, then you have the mission. So a plastic-free ocean. So the mission, as you see the words, are reduction of 90% of plastics entering the marine environment and collection of more than half of the plastics present in our ocean seas and coastal areas by 2025. So it's got some quantitative goals and a time limit. It's like a goal, but with some excitement in it, you know? And then you can see the next phase is the stakeholders that have to be involved to make it happen. And then some strategies is uh, uh, reusable and biodegradable plastic substitutes, some strategies that they're working on to achieve this. So I got this from here. This is an example, but we hope to emulate this in um, our visions to achieve racial equity and justice. So based on the three themes, I came up with three draft missions. So this is something we worked on, which everybody like said, what is this? You know, it's okay. The whole point of this is everything is interconnected. So here are three draft, draft missions um, based, on, based on the three themes that we developed. And this we'll work on, it's just something I threw out. By 20, 
for well-being and resilience across the lifespan by 2030, nurture an inclusive and sustainable environment where all feel a sense of belonging, are valued, depended on, and matter. The opportunity to thrive is by 2030, support ecosystems of opportunities in our community to strengthen economic, human, human social, cultural, and natural assets for all. And justice for all is by 2030, build bridges and break down barriers, ensuring everyone in our community has access to a good quality of life. So when I say all, I mean all, all members, everyone, including those of us from racial, ethnic groups and histor historically underrepresented identities in our community. We will work to eliminate and reduce disparities and promote equity, always looking around to ensure no one is left behind. So these are drafts we can work on. But the whole point of a mission is you can see whether it's done or not done. You know, it has to be simple. Even if we just take out the last part, by 2030, nurture an inclusive and sustainable environment, uh, support ecosystems of opportunity, and build bridges and break down barriers. But we have to make it so it's really clear whether we're getting there or not getting there. Any questions so far on this? Okay, this one is on the bike path, actually. This is taken by my husband. He says he was on a bike, didn't even get off, and got this photograph, which is, I think, really cool with the two Canada geese and their baby. So here, this is what you worked on last time, right? Creating this, uh, applying the iceberg model um, to racial equity and justice. And what I did there was put some headlines that we've seen is Niskayuna. So in the last week, actually, Lisa and I were talking, you know, last year Niskayuna had to create task force for racial equity and justice. And then there was Niskayuna Town would make second call for task force. And then over the weekend, it was Niskayuna says task force applications may have been lost in the email. Um, then there is uh, ex Niskayuna official laughs of black force photo complaints, the ex police told controller when you know that 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 she said so I'm, I'm convinced that chief wall's hostility anger and threats towards me are racially motivated since i am it's redacted and then niskayuna students hold racial slurs at schenectady girls and student leaders to meet after racist remarks at new york girls soccer and niskayuna school officials push back against growing angst over school-based diversity equity and initiatives and decades of racial isolation have shaped lives of Niskayuna students. So you see these mixed headlines, right? You know, you see the something, but people kind of also pushing back about it. So we are kind of working in a context where there seem to be conflict, definitely. Uh, but people are not quiet about it. And we were talking just before everybody got on the call saying, we are thrilled that actually that people apply to be on the task force and we should see a, a, quite a few faces and then we'll be discussing you know how well i won't put words in your mouth but anyway so our task now i'm going this is it that was the presentation so our task now is to brainstorm ideas for how you would like to address the challenges structural challenges and mental models identified in the iceberg model. You can write in chat or speak up. There's very few, so you can speak up. And I will write it down. And then think about specific situations. What programs or policies would address racial equity and justice in Niskayuna? So for now, I'm going to get out of this mode. And let's see if I can move this, because I'm going to write so you can see. Right. You can still see my screen, I'm hoping. So I am, let's see, I'm here. So here right now, I just want us to brainstorm. We're going to use, I uh, kind of kept three blank, street, uh, blank slides. I can add more. But brainstorm strategies or policies you would like to see in Niskayuna that address racial equity and justice. And then we'll go back and talk about who should be involved. And we'll go back, if we have time, and categorize them. But first, just brainstorm what you think should be happen in Niskayuna to address racial equity and justice. We've seen the conflicts that are happening. Some are unintended, you know, or some people are not aware, or sometimes they are aware. So 
what would you say? Anybody, any, any of the, we're not going to any specific theme, anything. I don't know, Freddie, can you give us an example? I'm struggling with what. Yeah. What so one, when Margaret, uh, when Margaret Brennan wrote to me saying she couldn't make the meeting, one of the things she said, what we need to do is change the narrative, which I thought was interesting. And what she, and, and it's just that it seems like the story sometimes seemed so negative about racial equity and justice. I think that's where she just said, let's, we have to change the narrative. So for me, one example, and I, I like it only because it was textbook and I kind of predicted it would happen, was say something like the, what is it? That cultural, what is it? Theory of, hey, the one of- Critical race theory. Critical race theory, thank you. It doesn't come, it's not an easy thing to kind of get off the tongue. It's just not intuitive, but that's why it was selected by this, uh, critical race theory, basically the school decided they're going to change the social studies curriculum and, and introduce how race, you know, redlining and all those issues. They never use the word critical race theory, but basically talk about race and kind of reflect history of race in the social studies. And uh, over, over the, across the country, I was reading about critical race theory and I was reading about this journalist came up with this idea because it's like a complicated, what critical sounds critical, right? Negative race is controversial and theory sounds academic, like it's not in touch with people. So let's use it and people don't understand what it is anyway. And just say schools are teaching racial, ra race, uh, critical race theory. And what he saw was this whole concept of talking about race, he felt makes white people feel a sense of humiliation. And he wanted to kind of tap into that and get people enraged. And he, for the most part, he succeeded. If he used the right words, he got people stepping back a bit. But at our, so then I was just reading this and I saw the school put out the equity strategy. And I said, fall, you know, somebody's going to protest. And I was telling my son. And the next day there was a student at the school board meeting and she texted my son saying, you won't believe what those folks here are saying. And it was, they were the two parents were protesting critical race theory. And there was a crowd outside the school board protesting it. And uh, so then, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you say, oh, you know, they need to talk. And so there were some letters the following week in, in, in Yonis Kayuna saying, what do you do with history? You know, do you just not give parts of history which are true and should be taught? You know, there are two, two sides. So when you complicate the narrative, basically you get the folks who are protesting this and the, and the folks who say history need to be taught and basically get them to see where they have common ground. And so there are groups and there are questions, 20 questions you can ask to get people to kind of get connected with their own humanity, which, which clearly says, you know, what are you talking about? What do you want to see? So it's really not so much protesting or, or trying to connect people with each other. So that is that is one example I was thinking. If something like that happens, one person can say, don't teach this. The other person says, can teach this. But it doesn't move and change anybody's mind. But if you get the groups to come together and talk about what is it that's troubling them and what do they want to see and what do they want to see happen, you, you get a better conversation. So there's a whole whole uh, kind of training on how you complicate the narrative. So that, that was one example I was thinking. So anything, like I was trying to brainstorm, I looked through some of the resources. The other part of changing the narrative is what I call, what people call, if something is happening right in, in the town, great, or anywhere where people can relate, kind of bring it up, amplify it, and share those stories. They call that positive deviance, you know? If something is working, figure out why it's working, what is the context and share those stories. So those are some of the techniques for uh, changing the narrative. Another one, let me, since both uh, Dustin and John are part of uh, police, the justice for all, 
the some examples of that could be uh, a conversation very often is that when there are mental health issues, how should uh, criminal justice be involved, right? So that's an area that needs to be considered. Um, I know there is a, in Ithaca, when they put their po police reform plan, they actually split up their response into gru uh, two groups, one that will be unarmed and, for and one, basically they'll triage the calls and where there's a mental health component, they'll send unarmed groups with some mental health folks with it. So, you know, things like that. Those are, those are policies that, that, that people take to address. So you get that, John? Is the, are those examples good enough? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you're looking for specific policies like? Yeah, like policies or programs, anything. If you can get three, uh, if you can uh, brainstorm at least nine, I think that'll be a start. Nine or 10. I have like a follow-up question. Sure, Dana. So, so when you were talking about how um, people like needed to talk more about, like uh, in response to the critical race theory issue, like would an actual strategy be um, something like implementing more like diversity, equity, and inclusion, like training into, um, I don't know, maybe schools or like holding more of those sort of like DEI sessions for like people in the community? Like, is that like a tangible strategy that you, that could be like on the list? I'm just trying to like, I guess. Yeah, we are brainstorming. Like it could be, yeah. Yeah, but having a group, it can be a. It doesn't have to be a school group, or it can be a right. partnership group that actually takes this up. Because none of this will happen if nobody takes a lead. Right? You need mm -hmm. somebody to take responsibility. So, if as a community we decide that this is something we want to take up, that that we would do. After this, when we brainstorm that this is just a start, we'll add to it based on what it is is we'll see there are groups already doing something like this in the town, in the committees, in the school. And if they're not, that's a gap. And if this is a, this is a best practice strategy, then how do we do it, right? So yeah, Dana, so something like that. It could be training, it could be having, you know, some kind of panel facilitated discussions. That would be a strategy. But who, somebody has to take the lead. And at this time, we won't go that far yet. That will be our next question when we go through this again. So I'm going to put that here. Uh, training or facilitation of uh, kind of conflict issues, I'll call it. Example, critical race theory. So going back to the change in the narrative, I think one of the things that is maybe a little bit unique about NISC unit in taking this challenge, this overall challenge on is that at least my sense is NISC unit is in, in a pretty good mindset as a community toward these things where sure there were two letters and a couple other comments about the school's change to, to social studies and teaching, teaching about history of race in the United States, but that's all. Like, there weren't protests at the high school. There weren't, you know, that there's been a pretty muted response. And I think most people in, in this, you know, I assume the reaction is somewhere from eh, to yes, that's great, right? Um, so I think we've got a chance. We don't have entrenched opposition to a lot of these ideas in, in massive numbers. I'd like to know if I'm right about that, but that's my sense from what I've heard here in these meetings and, and what I've experienced in this unit. And I think that what's left is the sort of, um, well, it's the stuff that, that, that white fragility is about, right? Where people sort of aren't actively harmful, but they're not helping either. And I think this unit is a community that we could move toward being more engaged 
a lot of people in Niskina through some of the things that Dan is talking about here with training and facilitation. You know, maybe a white fragility workshop similar to the one Proctor's did with um, with anti racism um, and and Kendi. Uh, but equipping the people of Niskayuna who who feel like, yeah, we should probably teach about the reality of race in, in our schools, but don't really know how to take it beyond that, um, to have conversations with the people that are writing these letters and try and change those, change those conversations. And so that meetings in Niskayuna are taken to a higher level and not arguing about these things that were, these memes that were fed, like critical race theory is bad and are taken at a higher level of how can we actually recognize a problem and address it. I think Niskayuna is one of the relatively rare communities that could do that. Um, and we just, we need to figure out the tools to move there, to move that needle a relatively short but difficult distance versus other places in the United States that I can think of where it's a much longer travel to go toward really having a place that meets all of these inclusive inclusivity goals. More engagement came up for me was is a way to get more resident participation. There are actually very innovative techniques like citizens assembly, participative budgeting to get more buy-in and more, if, you, if, if our residents are so engaged to get more engagement. And that's something we could consider. Uh, we have never done it in Niskayuna. If we are really engaged, then that's a possibility. I don't necessarily think people in Niskina are engaged. Okay. <laughs> that's, that wasn't quite what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I think they're disengaged, but very uh, abstractly positive toward the things, toward inclusivity goals, toward justice for all, all those things. Probably the, the vast majority of Niskina would be say, yeah, that's good. Go do that. But they don't want to get involved and they don't have the tools to have an impact with the minimal level of involvement they're willing to make. So I don't know if participative budgeting would be something that most members of, of NISC you know, would be interested in, but they might be interested in having tools to be able to have a conversation with their kids or with their neighbors about the things that go on in this in the town and change the way that the average level of conversation in the town, both toward what is acceptable and what isn't, and toward how the town should govern itself and, and how, it, how it should move forward. So that things like we should change our curriculum or things like we should adopt an Ithaca-like policing structure. So that when those conversations come up as a policy matter, the people in the, in the town who hear this are equipped with the tools to understand what that means. And this isn't critical race theory and the, the woke elites. This is a very sensible thing. Um, I think if we give them the tools to understand those, that that lays the foundation for moving policies, progressive policies forward. What do others think? John? Yeah, so um, at my, my church, uh, it's in Schenectady, it's a Unitarian Universalist Church, but they have some different programs um, around the whole racial equity topic. And there was a book club, um, a book that we read was, I think it was called Raising White Kids. Um, they had a book club with uh, Stacey Abrams' book. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think, um, you know, there might be parents within the community that would be interested in, um, you know, things that are geared toward raising children and teaching them about this topic. Okay. Sorry. All right. Uh, what about the other part that I thought would be good is to really kind of work on what we call inclusive spaces, you know, making sure that public spaces or, or even meeting spaces, they're inclusive. Uh, we have a lot of green around in Niskayuna. 
uh, we uh, how many public spaces do we have? Do our parks, do people feel welcome in our spaces? And there are actually tools to kind of look at that, to see how many spaces they have where people meet, gather, and if they're inclusive. So I was just thinking how I know that in our neighborhood, they tried to get like a neighborhood block meeting just to get people to get to know each other. And I know it's taken years, but you know, it, it's still, we're still building on it. So what do you think about the issue of building inclusive spaces in our community? But this is brainstorming. I'm not taking anything out. Okay, so if I'm not canceling, everybody's welcome. What do you think about that? Where people can meet, gather, get to know each other. This is just like a very general thought, but I think with Miskiuna, I think what makes it sometimes hard for people to, I guess, come together in a sense is because every you always like need a car to get around places. Like it's very hard to just sort of like walk to a local park or I don't know I just feel like you need a car to get anywhere pretty much and maybe that might be something that makes it difficult for people to come together um but yeah just a very general thought mm -hmm. yeah so but so one thing we could look at is they don't all have to come to one place right are the meeting are is everybody in different parts of Niskayuna have space where they can meet and gather but while walking they don't need a car i think that's something we can look at you know you don't all have to come to the town hall to meet you know but if somebody is in Lyshakil lives in Lyshakil is there a space where people can gather and meet So it's something to look at. And then the whole, uh, Dana, when you talked about, I thought about complete streets. The town does have a complete streets community com committee, which basically looks at access issues. So it kind of is tied into inclusive spaces, you know, where people can, can move, can get to places, but again, is it only the folks who live in the main part of Niskayuna have access to these inclusive spaces or do it's something to look at. Maybe then people who are marginalized don't get to live in the parts of Niskayuna where it's easy to get to a space. So that's what we can look at is to see how far, how easy or hard is it for people from different parts of Niskayuna to meet and get to know each other and to feel included. All right, what else? Uh, the other thing I was looking at is um, housing affordability. You know, when I was looking at uh, what is, how do you figure, we know that one of the statistics I didn't present over here, I think it was 22% of, we'll do that next time in August, of Niskayuna's residents pay more than 30% of their income in housing, which is considered burdensome. So in terms of housing affordability, what policies can we look at? Especially when people are you know, struggling to stay in places. Are we welcoming when people of different racial and ethnic groups come to New York, in this case, you know, do they feel welcomed? Because very often, and I work in public health, and they say, you know, you should not have areas of concentrated poverty. It's just not good policy. It doesn't make for a healthy place. So, so the, very often it is, you know, have uh, policies that get kind of break up these groups of very concentrated, concentrated poverty. So they're little kind of spread out and it's not everybody poor is not in one place. But when that happens very often, people don't feel welcome 
and then they go back to where they feel more welcome. So do we welcome people? Uh, I know that Jody, you said welcoming. Is India, is Minsky no welcoming? Welcoming environment. And that again is tied to inclusive spaces. And I want to clarify that's sort of welcoming to residents versus welcoming to passers by or sort of a you know a, a day trip. Right. Well, no, see, welcoming to save people from another, say even from Schenectady moved to Niskayuna to become a resident. Do they yeah. feel welcome in Niskayuna? That's what I'm asking, not passerbys. I'm asking about people living in this Kayuna. If you do you to be honest, the you know, my husband and I were saying we don't we've not had too many negative experiences. When we, when we first moved here, uh in, it was we moved here in eighty nine and in ninety we were looking for a place in this Kayuna because it was closer to where my husband worked. And actually one of the apartment complexes we visited, which had vacancies, they said actually discouraged discouraged us. They said, you won't like this space. You won't like this place. And we were like, what is wrong with it? You have a vacancy. Why do you keep saying we don't like it? Oh, you won't like this. You won't like this. Basically, you know, the, she was discouraging us from renting. And we didn't. We kind of laughed it off because, well, okay. But I'm, I'm thinking that I know that no longer happens in that apartment complex. For, I know for sure. But now, then I'm looking back, I said, that's what she was doing. And I wonder if that happens to people in, when people look for housing in Niskayuna. We don't know, right? So that's something we need to, for new, we got to, we got to find out. But the problem is we, we don't really know who are the marginalized communities. That's what I'm getting at. So these are some questions we have to uh, new residents. You know, sometimes some residents would be welcome, some may not. And that's something we, we don't know. We have to find out. The other policy I was thinking was um, In terms of economics, you know, very often if people, one of the big policies for equity, and, I, and I'm and i trying to figure out how it works in this Kayuna, is procurement. That's what governments do. That's what schools do. Any public agencies buys a lot of things, right? And who you buy it from is important. And so very often procurement is an important tool in addressing equity. Because if you buy local, if you buy from local communities that first local, and if you if you buy from communities that are trying to come up, then you promote equity. So what are procurement policies for Niskayuna, town of Niskayuna, and the school district? That is one of the questions we could be asking because those address equity. When we look at equity, we, you look at one, that's one of the things we'll discuss more at the next meeting, is you look at the town of Niskayuna within the context of Schenectady County, within the context of the capital region, especially when it comes to economics. And, and the reason is because you need that kind of broad region to kind of build community wealth. You know, you don't have everybody who buys your stuff in Iskayuna. Or I do I earn my living by working in Albany, right? Things like that. You get that? So I'm gonna, I don't know if you understood the whole part about procurement, but I'm just going to go to the next page here and put a question mark. But that is considered a best policy. You know, how you buy, what products you buy, and who you buy it from makes a, makes a difference for equity. And from, for, for, yeah? Sorry, I'm just going to add another one. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just, I, I think these are all, these all look good to me. Um, for me, my, my background on the racial equity task force has been around the public safety. Mm -hmm. So, I think we made like 80 different recommendations on our report. So mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to 
try to rattle them all off, but there's a lot of strategies and policies and suggestions and recommendations that are in that, at least collaborative work that it seems to me maybe all, all or some of which may be relevant for this conversation. It's a regarding how is the, how does the police work? Not just who, who make, who responds to mental health calls, but there's all kinds of recommendations that I report um, in, and so I'm not sure how to say it, but there's there's certainly been a lot of work done by the task force. If you're looking for specific recommendations on policies to look at, um, yeah, no, I did. Not. Yeah, I did, uh, John. I did look at the collaborative report and the audit report, and I actually gave sent in a comment on the audit see any audit report. I did not comment on the collaborative report, and I will send it to y'all, and I'll post it on the handouts. With both the reports, my, my concern was that they really did not, I, th I think the collaborative report did a better job, at least of talking with a few people, but they didn't really include people who were directly affected by what was happening and probably because they were short in, in a short time period. So again, not talking with folks who were affected by police action was an issue. The, the one thing about Niskayuna police reform report is, 86% of the interactions were people outside the county, right? It was only 16%, I think, or 16, yeah, I think it was 16% of Niskina residents. And nothing in the police report talked about collaboration regionally. And for me, that was like, well, if you only work with Niskina residents, what are you going to resolve, right? So I think there were some things missing in the police report which I think it's it's good to discuss. I, I do, I, I'll tell you what the audit and the, the final report talked about wellness, police wellness, the, you know, do more training and wellness, which is a good thing. Um, they talked about that, uh, you know, having, having more research. Basically, I think they were talking about data because data is a big issue. They talked about that. They talked about, um, interacting more with Niskayuna residents, you know, having town hall meetings. And that is the issue I said, if you interact with Niskayuna residents and 86% of the interactions are outside Niskayuna, you really have to talk also more about collaboration. And from what I was reading recently, I think uh, Schenectady County is doing some kind of a, a, a countywide system you know, uh, to kind of streamline and to help. So maybe that'll help with the data. So anyway, so all I'm saying, John, I've read the reports and I did, and I'll, I'll send you all the comments. I'll, I'll give you all the comments. I'll put it in the handouts. But I think if you only look at the reports, they don't address everything. That's my only concern. No, I, I, I didn't, I didn't in any way, shape or form suggest that that's all we need to look at. I think yeah. we're brainstorming about policies and, and suggestions and things to look at. There's a lot of them that are in that report. Yeah, no, I can put, we'll include those over here, but I would also like us to look at what was missing in the report and also include it over here. I know, for example, uh, Marina is not on the call. She stepped back or she got overwhelmed. She mentioned Cahoots. A program. Whenever you talk about programs, though, that's a lot of money that it needs to come with money. When you talk about policies, a little more advocacy and gives you more freedom. But basically, having mental health staff, you know, address mental health calls, and it's a program out of uh, Oregon. But it's it's in our resources. But over here, I'll say look at police report, police reform report and include suggestions, all right? Because I, I do know there are like four, you know, like four committees and included some suggestions. I'm going to also put the ones about uh, mental health address. I'm not being specific here, but I'll look at what's up. What I'm going to do with this is between now and September, is look at what's the correct wording for what are proven strategies that other communities are doing and put them down there. Mental health.
And over here, I'll put example Ithaca as an ex sort of reminders and Kahoots, which is a evidence-based program. Then the other part I will talk about is data. Data is pretty weak with the police uh, group. Like I said, uh, when I talked to CNA, they basically said most of, except for the traffic stops, most of the other data were pencil and paper. But I think, uh, like I said, the county may have bought a system and maybe that will change. But there are best practices for data on what to collect, uh, you know, which right now most, it seems, in the capital region may not be doing. So data, a better quality data collection. And this is across the board, OK? So because data is always hard, but you need to measure it for police. And like I said, there are best practices. I don't know how to do this. Like even inclusion and social uh, cohesion, that data is hard to find. What else? There's justice for all. With environment, the data is a little old. For Niska Yuna, I, there was a consultant that worked in 2010, and it, it came out pretty good, but I don't know if they have a way of doing it. But there's a climate committee in Niska Yuna, which we can ask if there's anything updated. I don't think there is. OK, so I think what I'm getting at is you can do a number of these in each of the missions, but we have, but how do we implement it, right? Who needs to be involved? We don't have any money. The town has not allocated any money for us. So our greater chances are if we can see if it's already on somebody's, in somebody's bucket, like the police reform, right? they already have something in the bucket, then they will more likely to implement it. But the others, the changing narrative, who's in charge? Who, who would do that? So we have to now, after we do this, figure out who needs to get involved and who already may be doing some of it and maybe work with them. So we'll stop here for this and see it's 7.03. We do have 25 minutes. So I'm going to go through this again and see which of these, we'll just work with a couple, let's say changing the care, the narrative or training or engagement. Who are the sectors that you think would be more likely, would be like partners in this? The first three. Well, I'll take the easy one and say proctors. <laughs> Proctors, okay. Who else? These have to be like cross sectoral, right? It can't be just one group. They'd say, no, we're done. I think the school district may be interested, but they may not take a lead because they often, you know, when somebody talks like that, even it's maybe two people. You know, you, you do get a little anxious if nobody else kind of, you know, they kind of need the support to say, hey, the community is behind us. Should the like town board maybe get involved in some way? I just would always think these things would happen at town hall, but I'm not also too, too familiar with their stake in this? Town, I think town board, I don't know. I know they have a task force. You think the task force would be, this is something that they could consider? John, I'm looking at John. Oh, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And I'm wondering, pretty about something you said earlier about having making sure that we have the affected communities involved. So yeah. I think that is obvious, but it needs to be on every, every list to make sure that it's not, you know, make sure it's a it's an inclusive group. All right, let's put these four for now. We're not sure about citizen assembly, participative budgeting. But over here, this need tools to understand situation was a clarification about what was. So I'm going to just leave it there. So whatever we do, there needs to be tools. Book clubs, raising children. Who would be? I don't watching? think that was the the meaning of that. Wasn't it like you said, I think what I heard you say is that they may not be interested so much and they just need tools to figure out what to do. Questions, isn't that what you said, Destin? Yes, but it's not, I, I think that's the strategy. I think it's actually, well, I think that's as much a strategy as on any of the rest of this. You know, it's, it's maybe, a way toward getting more engagement. Generally, or all, right? Across all? Yes. Yeah. I guess it, it sounded like you were writing that off as, well, sure, whatever we do, we'll need tools no, for it. And it's I, don't, a way I don't think that should get removed from the list that way. No, no, it's not removed. It's, it's just that it's a way of working. Whenever we put anything on the list, what you're saying is we need to have tools under them because people won't know what to do. I'm not writing it off. I'm just saying it's a cross-cutting. That you could just can't say, hey, let's do training and facilitation, but you need to have some tools so people know what to do or how to go about it. Right? No? I, I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. But well, I, like, say, don't okay. Let me but, stop you on this. I'm no, sorry. no, but no, no. I'm trying to clarify if I understood it. Like changing the narrative. Margaret says, change. I say, great, yeah, we should change the narrative. But how? What do we do? So, for example, I have this, uh, I, it's actually on the resource list on complicating the narrative, 20 questions you can ask to change the narrative, which anybody can do, but it's incredibly hard. And that is actually very helpful for me personally, because I can use it in any situation, but it's extremely hard, like I said, because, mm -hmm. uh, but that is a good tool, you know? And if you, get, if you armed everybody to say, how to ask questions without shutting off a conversation. That's a good tool to have. I see. So it's a way of working. I'm thinking anything we do, we will have tools under it so people can work with it. A, a, a questions or a way of working or explaining. Oh, I, see. I think the difference is you're thinking of tools for us. I'm yeah. thinking of tools for residents Com of Miskiuna. Yeah, no, this is tools for community. Yeah, as is community. We just happen to be here. So this would be tools for anybody in the community. That's what I was thinking. I'm not only thinking of us. I think we're talking about the same thing, but we'll keep it here for now. Okay. I Let's see. Let's see. And we may be able to identify some of the tools we'll develop, not only for us, but for anybody who wishes to do this. Just gonna keep it here. It's, I'm not taking it away. I, I, I just think, say when we do change the narrative, we'll have strategies and one, two, three, four tools we'll develop for anybody interested who will participate and be able to use it and, and change the narrative. So book clubs, when you were talking about Jodi, you were talking about a church, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe but church groups would be good here, actually, or even over here on top, because I'm going to put that, it's kind of a similar kind of thing. Faith groups, I'll call them, okay? Sure. To be more, because they maybe have facilitators who can help. 
Okay, so I'm going to say, say, I'm going to leave this aside because we didn't really talk about this. So building inclusive spaces, complete streets. Who would be sectors here? I, yeah, I think there's, there's some work done around this with, you know, creating, you know, paths for biking and things like that on Niskayuna roads, but I just don't know which group. Yeah, it is a complete streets committee for the town. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe that's a group that may be interested in building in inclusive spaces a little bigger than only bigger than complete streets. And to be honest, I don't know if anybody's working on it because it's. Uh, but maybe that's a that's one group to start with. And like you said, we could put the task force on all, but we really need to see if another group would be involved because it's hard for the task force. to do everything without a budget and a staff person, to be honest. But anyway, that's a, that's a group we can start with. Housing affo affordability and welcoming environment for new residents in Niskayuna. I assume planning would be involved in housing affordability. Mm -hmm. And this, we don't really have all the information. So need more information on welcoming environment. This might apply for all of these, honestly, but um, I think we would need support from county level and state level officials as well, especially county level for, for a lot of these, um, if, for housing affordability in particular. I think the, the probably money that we would need is at least at the county level. Mm -hmm. okay. This would be town the school is actually looking at the equity strategy and they're pretty uh, and they they are kind of open to suggestions so that's that's something we could talk to them about those are the two public organizations that's why the two large public organizations so this that's just a little statement there Mental health interactions, cahoots. This would be the new implementation committee, police reform implementation committee. That's a pretty broad committee. And the same thing with the data collection. So basically, we are looking at two of the committee, three of the committees from the town the complete streets, the climate, and the police reform. The climate committee is interesting in, in that, I think it's called smart something, in, in that they're a regional, they are a regional approach and they don't only do Niskayuna. So it, as a working committee, it will be interesting to see how that works. So anyway, so having said that, I'm going to go through this one more time and say, if we were to think of which part of the mission this would be this, I would put it as the well-being uh, mission, resilience mission. If we were to do citizen, citizens assembly, and I, I know we didn't discuss it, uh, it would still go under well-being. If we did building inclusive spaces and complete streets, that would still be well-being. If we did housing 
affordability, it would be opportunity to thrive. I'll spell that correctly later. Procurement policies would be opportunity to thrive. And this would be justice. This would be justice. And the police in police would be justice. Inclusion and social cohesion would be well being. An environment climate committee, this could be opportunity. So I'm just going through this quickly. The one thing that I don't think we have over here, when we talked about strategies um, and, and we talked about across the lifespan, we don't, we have quite a few of older adults in our community. And we don't really have anything focusing on older adults. Maybe when over here, when we talk about inclusive spaces, you know, say pay, say look at older adults as well. Because that is, as you noticed in our demographic data, there were quite a few of our older adults who were under the poverty level. And they can, I was reading something in the New York Times today saying older adults are one of our marginalized groups, you know? And so one of the questions Dana asked is when, do, how do you talk about all these groups and then not lose your focus on racial equity and justice? Because I may, may be talking about older adults. Am I still addressing racial equity and justice when I talk about older adults? What do you think? I thought that was a good question, Dana. Any thoughts? We have quite a lot over here, to be honest. I'll tell you what I told Dana is that you know we have to we don't know who these who the marginalized groups are, right? We're trying to get them, we're trying to reach out to them, we want to listen and be open to hearing. And some there's a lot, some of them may be older adults and belonging to these racial equity groups. We looked at the median income. That's the median, that's what most people do have. But there are people at either ed end of the spectrum, right? So you kind of have to look at all anybody who's marginalized because they could also belong to one of the racial ethnic groups, right? So you end up basically that's that's the advantage of working with equity is you don't leave anybody behind. And it helps a lot more people than just people of color. Yeah, does that kind of make sense? That's why I'm talking about older adults here. Any comments, any thoughts? Yeah, I thought that explanation was helpful. And I think when, like, I think in the second slide where we were talking about, like, um, better quality data collection, I think that also just gets tied into that because hopefully we can find better like demographic breakdowns of specific factors. Um, Cause I know Niskuna is still a pretty small town and yeah, I, th I think sometimes if it's not, I think when it like wasn't explicit in the be in the beginning, like when we were looking through the indicators, I just like, wasn't sure. Right. But I think it's just tied into that. Right. So, yeah. So, Dana, we never lose sight of it. But because we don't know specifically who you're looking for, we address all groups that may be potentially be 
be marginalized. So it keep people with disabilities, older people, poor, you know, because we know that the groups have potential for, you know, fewer opportunities. So, all right. So I'm going to put this in something like this, okay? And I think hopefully it'll be a little more visual then, but I'll send it to you out of the meeting minutes. So to review the timeline, uh, we are in July 20th where we talked about demographics. The mission says draft, so we will kind of play around with the words a little bit more. We talked about collaborators, we talked about policies. John, I will look at the the police reform report and pick up some policies from there and put it in for justice for all. I will also send, send folks on this call my comments for the police reform report and I'll put it on the handouts for anybody else who wants to read it. And uh, next, on August 17th, we'll talk about indicators again. Because we're such a small group, even most of our task force members are not on this call. What I was going to suggest is after we get what we call, we are working from a blank sheet of paper. We put some writing to allow a lot of time for comment. The task force is in transition. Um, many people have not participated in the call to leave at least six months for people to come in so we can change. And in the meanwhile, we can you know, keep tweaking and we'll, we'll figure out on September what our next steps are. So if we go to, let's see the last slide, I'll fill out this with what we brainstormed and uh, there will be some questions because some we didn't quite reach consensus on. We are having a subgroup virtual meeting on Wednesday, July 28th from 6 to 7.15. I know so far Dana, Dustin, and Jody will be on. John, if you'd like to be on, please come on. Our next meeting is Tuesday, August 17th, 6 to 7.30. And that's it for now. So at the, at the subgroup meeting, we'll try and come up with indicators based on what we discussed. Uh, these will be what we call long-term indicators, the you know, impact indicators uh, for how we'll decide whether we are building well-being resilience across the lifespan, opportunity to thrive justice for all. John, I'll put Niskayuna on all those charts before I send out the revised presentation so it's clear. All right, that's all from me. I think it's 7.24, we did pretty good on time. Any other thoughts, anything? Anything in demographics, I kind of rushed you because I didn't want to not, I didn't want to lose time on policies. If you have other ideas for policies, let me know and I'll add them in, all right? Uh, but this will be just a draft, but we will talk about it a little more in September again. Um, and then what we I'm hoping we'll do after September is propose it to the task force, but it's always going to be a draft because like I said, we've not had enough participation. So then we need to figure out, are we on track? Is this what people are thinking? And uh, it'll give the new task force time to settle into. Anything else? Any other questions? Any other comments? No. Thanks for your work on this. Oh, Jody, thank you. Yes, thank you, Priti. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Jody. This is a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's uh, fast. It's actually, Dana is very interested, as you can see. She is jumped right in. And Dustin and Jody, hopefully we will have some indicators to discuss at the subgroup meeting. Yeah? All right. Well, thank you. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye.